Good evening, everybody. Um, thanks for the invite to speak tonight. It's a, a privilege and an honour. Um, and uh, thanks for the nice introduction. Uh, I'm, I, I'm just going to briefly describe the discovery of the boats and then hand over to the expert, uh, who's Niall. Um, my role in this is, uh, one could say, um, almost a sort of an accidental one uh, mm -hmm. for reasons that you will see. Yeah, I've subtitled my part of the talk, Serendipity, Timing, Lucky Finn and Kevin the Dolphin, and Kieran has given you a little taste uh, there. Uh, so very quickly, to give you an idea, um, uh, uh, in April of this year, uh, on the 24th of April, which was a Saturday, I bought a new drone. <laughs> um, I, I, I had, as you know, um, I previously made good use of drones. Drones uh, are a technology that have proven themselves to be extremely useful in terms of archaeological reconnaissance, uh, the likes of which was previously done uh, using aircraft um, and was much more expensive and all the rest, pioneered by the likes of uh, uh, Leo Swan, the late Leo Swan and uh, Dr. Gillian Barrett, etc. Um, drones are an inexpensive, relatively inexpensive technology compared to planes. One of the great advantages of drones is that you can float them in the same place. They have GPS technology on board, which means they can hover in the same place. Uh, when you're on even a Cessna, you're, you're moving at a minimum of maybe 70 or 80 miles an hour. You don't get to see the landscape in the same detail as you're sweeping over it. The other thing is that drones generally, unless you have special permissions and licensing, uh, operate between the ground and 400 feet or 120 meters above ground level. What this means effectively is that they fly in a zone that's closer to the ground than most planes and helicopters tend to do when they're on reconnaissance. This, in my opinion, has been advantageous to the drone pilot versus the, the uh, casual private pilot. And you see quite a lot of those flying over the Boyne Valley regularly, uh, almost on a daily uh, occurrence, but guaranteed if you're out at Newgrange or Nowth or Douth uh, over a weekend, you'll see a Cessna or you'll see a small plane circling the area. Somebody on board is having a look at the monuments. Anyway, um, sorry, I just want to advance to the next slide if I can. So um, it, last year, of course, we had COVID-19. Um, the schools were off. Uh, there were lots of lockdowns and uh, I was working from home. Uh, which I found tremendously advantageous, by the way, silver linings and all that. Uh, one of the wonderful things about last year was that myself and my youngest son, Finn, that's Finn in the picture, went on regular lunchtime walks. Uh, and if you note the date there, that's the 26th of October, 2020. And this was taken on the shore of the Boyne River uh, on one of our many, we were basically going for a walk every lunchtime uh, on weekdays. It was fabulous. It was a wonderful opportunity to, uh, you know, to, to re reconnect with family and spend quality uh, father and son time that wouldn't have been possible uh, if there was no pandemic because he'd be at school and I'd be at a desk in Dublin at work. Mm -hmm. uh, that's Saskia the dog by the way she was 10 yesterday she's a husky um, so that the drone on the left there is the the new one that's the Mavic uh, sorry it's the DJI Mini 2 the one on the right is the Phantom 3 Advanced that is the one with which a fairly substantial discovery which you probably all know about at this stage uh, uh, was made uh, by myself in the company of Ken Williams on the 10th of July 2018 during a, a summer drought uh, and that is the one in the foreground there uh, on the floodplain in front of Newgrange that has become known as Drone Henge. And that uh, title, by the way, was cloned or <laughs> cloned, <laughs> uh, was coined by the media. I think it was Der Spiegel in Germany, actually, was the first one to call it Drone Henge. Mm -hmm. uh, and the name stuck. National Monuments Service uh, calls it the Geometric Henge. Uh, and uh, Steve Davis of UCD wanted to call it Site P1. So I think, in my opinion, Drone Henge is definitely the best of those three, but uh, that's a highly subjective area. Um, so following on that, the Mini 2, um, the, the reason uh, drones are, it, it's a technology that's relatively new, only about a decade ago, people started using drones. But what the drone does is it enables people like me who have an enthusiasm for archaeology uh, to get a look at the landscape from the air uh, it, which is something we couldn't do previously unless we 
bags of money and we were able to fork out money for you know private flights over the Boyne Valley etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, and all you need to do is charge up the batteries bring it in a bag and put it up in the air thankfully the regulations in Ireland uh, are European regulations now they're actually not as strict as they used to be and because the Mini 2 weighs less than 250 grams it can be flown in urban areas heavier drones can't be flown over people that are not involved, in other words, people that don't know the drone is there or haven't been asked for their permission. Uh, and they can also be flown in, in urban areas and closer to buildings where heavier drones can't. This is obviously an advantage when it comes to urban uh, flying. Anyway, around this time, the 24th of April, I had bought the drone and I was doing test flights that weekend, Saturday and Sunday. And during the previous uh, week or maybe 10 days or two weeks, a lot of excitement had been aroused by a, a rare visitor to the River Boyne in Drogheda, and that was in the form of a dolphin who was later identified as uh, a dolphin that had been identified in the Shannon River in the 1980s, uh, called Kevin Costner, 1990s, I think, Kevin Costner. And the reason he was called Kevin Costner was apparently he was very protective of the females in the Shannon. And at the time, the movie The Bodyguard was in... Uh, the cinema and uh, the uh, the uh, the wildlife conservation people decided to call him Kevin Costner. Now, <laughs> uh, I, I had done several what called test flights, trying to uh, ascertain how the new drone was performing in comparison to other drones I had flown, um, and making test flights uh, in and around the Drogheda area. And it struck me on the Sunday that I should go down to the River Boyne and see if I could see Kevin the dolphin because you know. If I could get a picture from the air and maybe some video footage, that would be something that people hadn't seen previously. And uh, so I was quite excited about the idea. Now, it just so happened that on that afternoon on the 25th, which is the Sunday, that I arrived precisely at uh, the moment of low tide. And it's it's even there's there's I don't I don't know how many of you believe in synchronicity, meaningful coincidences. My life is full of meaningful coincidences. But it happened that I had arrived at the moment of lowest tide uh, a day before the full moon, which means that the lo low and high tides are higher and lower than they are for the rest of the month. Uh, and um, also uh, about six weeks, uh, 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 you know, at, uh, uh, after a period of six weeks when we had little or no rain. And so the river was pretty low when it was low. And so I did several of these vertical scans of the river at altitude, looking basically with the camera facing straight down towards the ground, uh, towards the river, as it were, and the riverbed, uh, scanning the river slowly, looking for Kevin and couldn't see Kevin. So lots of other things, bits of trees, particularly birds, tires, lots of tires in the boyne. Something that drew my attention that day was this item here, which is circled. Um, and it was only when I got home that I saw it on the screen and I said, that looks peculiar. That almost looks like a canoe or some sort of a boat. So I said, I'll tell you what, Anthony, go down tomorrow, because, you know, if you know the way the moon works in relation to the tides, the high tide today will be repeated tomorrow, but about 40 or 50 minutes later. So I, I had a look at the tide charts and I said, right, I'll go down again at lunchtime tomorrow. So the next day was Monday, the 26th. Um, that item that's in the circle there turned out to be nothing. It was nothing more than what you might call an optical illusion. It was basically the way the sands or the mud on the riverbed had been shifted by the current. So what happens there in that stretch of river is that, you know, it, it, the river has widened out considerably and it's quite shallow so that when the tide is out, um, you know, a lot of those uh, shingle or stone or muddy sort of islands become visible and the river itself becomes these two narrow channels either side which is I think one of the reasons that there's a proliferation of log boats in this area of the river that they were washed down there uh, during surges during winter or spring surges and then as the river sort of widens and flattens out they just get left at the bottom anyway it was the following day uh, the discovery day the 26th and as I say, river levels were particularly particularly low. When I spotted this item um, on the riverbed, and I said, oh, that looks peculiar. And sure enough, when I brought the drone down towards it, I said, yeah, that's definitely, that's definitely not your average tree trunk or a bit of uh, storm detritus. 
it looked like it might be something man-made. And I can't, can't be any more specific than that because until April of this year, I had little or no knowledge of uh, log boats or dugout boats or water, you know, ancient uh, water or river going craft. I had no knowledge about that whatsoever. So uh, this is another photo. You'll see it there lodged on the bank. So basically, uh, the tires are sort of upstream. So as you imagine, the current is coming this way generally. And then when the tide turns, of course, there's a gentle sort of push up river. But generally, the movement of the river is from uh, from right to left in this image. And so the boat got deposited on the downstream side of this pointed island. Uh, I showed the photographs, not this one, this is, I've showed these photographs to uh, Steve Davis of UCD and myself and Steve are, are, have, have been friends for a number of years. Um, and uh, of course, Steve uh, gave me all sorts of encouragement at the time of just the discovery of Drone Henge. And he said, look, that definitely looks like something. Um, did you talk to National Monuments? And of course, that was absolutely my next stop. My next port of call is as soon as I see anything that I think might be a monument or an artifact or whatever, uh, first port of call is email to the National Monument Service, which I did. Uh, I think I emailed Geraldine Stout and I asked Geraldine if she could forward it to the relevant people. Um, and she did. She forwarded it to the underwater unit of National Monument Service, which was brilliant. I was also advised that I should report it to the National Museum, which I did. But then Steve came back and he said, um, I know this guy, Dr. Niall Gregory, who is, you know, I think he said that Niall had done his dissertation on dugout boats. And would I perhaps show them to him? And of course, I was uh, perfectly happy to do that because as the discoverer of this boat, I wanted to know more about it myself. Um, got into a dialogue with Niall by email, and shortly he agreed to come down to Drogheda uh, and wade out into the boim uh, and have a, a closer look at them. Um, the, uh, the, the, this is just basically a sack. So some people were asking, you know, is this perhaps, you know, the, the trousers of, of some ancient fisherman or, you know, some item of clothing that had been left? I said, no, unfortunately, the story isn't that uh, exciting. Uh, that's just detritus that got caught. So just to give you an impression of how low the water, you can see there's a brick there, you see the breeze block there, just how low the, the water was at the time was that from the bank of the river at low tide, you could actually picture the, the boat with a telephoto uh, lens. A part of it was uh, sticking out. So then in, in further uh, reconnaissance of the area that uh, uh, in, in, in those couple of days, 26, maybe 27th, I spotted this other object close by, I mean, only maybe 100 meters, maybe less away from the first boat. And this looked suspicious. So I said, right, I'd better refer that uh, to the authorities as well, which I did. That turned out to be a log boat. Nile, of course, is going to give us all of the, uh, the information about you know, how these craft were made and their dimensions and what we're looking at in these photographs. Um, I'm just blathering on because that's what journalists do. We pad out you know, and uh, uh, read it all on the nine o'clock news. Uh, that was the second boat. Um, there's the second boat again, and you can see actually how close it is to the public footpath there uh, on the north bank of the river. And in fact, you know, uh, dozens of people are walking up and down here every hour. This pathway is very busy. The, the, uh, the walks along the River Boyne are very popular in Drogheda. And sure, you know, you could walk past that um, 365 days a year and never know it was there. And even if you did chance upon it at a low tide after a drought, you mightn't think it was anything more than a heap of some sort of junk wood that had been washed down by the river. The following Sunday, I can't remember the date would have been the 25th plus seven days. Was that the 1st of May? The following Sunday morning, I went down to the river to have a look at the stretch between the Bridge of Peace and the location of the first log boat and spotted this object in the river uh, and got very excited. It uh, turns out that uh, Carol Brady from the National Monument Service underwater unit um, uh, having received my correspondence and my pictures came back after a few days and said that this boat here which is boat number one uh, was a new discovery uh, this boat here the second boat uh, had already been reported and was known about and this third boat was another new discovery so the first and the third boats 
were new discoveries. Obviously, tremendously exciting for me. I was delighted. I last thing I was expecting was to make archaeological discoveries. I was looking for a dolphin, you know, and I wouldn't have thought that you could see the riverbed from a drone. And in fact, on um, lots of flights since then, over the last number of months, I have discovered that I, I was really, really very lucky on the 25th and 26th of April and in that week after that the river levels were so low because of the lack of rainfall that in fact in the intervening months even during the summer when there wasn't much rain the river levels were even even when they're just a foot or two deeper that boat number three is completely invisible I haven't actually been able to get a better picture of it and um, so that will give you an indication of the sort of serendipity of the whole situation and the look so anyway, uh, Niall came down, as I said, on several occasions um, uh, to go into the river. Uh, and just to give you an idea of size, you can't see the boat in that picture. That's that boat there. But that's you, the, the aerial pictures maybe don't give you the scale. Uh, so there you see Niall standing in the river and the tape uh, from, from, from one, one end to the other gives you an indication of how long that boat is. So uh, fairly impressive. And so that's my role in it, as I say, almost accidental, uh, a huge amount of luck involved, like there was with Dronehenge. Dronehenge, I now am almost certain that Dronehenge would have been visible as a crop mark for at least three weeks before uh, that fateful evening when myself and Ken Williams put our drones into the air. So sometimes, yeah, it's about having, the, having a little bit of uh, gumption, a little bit of knowledge and a little bit of curiosity about what you're seeing. But there's a huge amount of luck involved in it too. So I'm going to pass over to the expert, and these are several uh, photographs of Niall uh, doing his thing, Dr. Gregory in action, and I'm going to hand over to him. And uh, this is the part where it gets really interesting because then you get to find out exactly what these things are. And I hope you'll be fascinated, I think you will, as I was uh, when I accompanied him on these trips and he started telling me about these craft, absolutely incredible. So thank you and uh, over to you, Niall. Well, first of all, I'd um, like to thank um, the members of Loud Archaeological Society for having us along this evening and giving us uh, a presentation. Mm -hmm. And also uh, to acknowledge Anthony in terms of his, uh, his time in his circumstance and his gumption, because without that, you know, I just wouldn't have, you know, the level of information that we actually have now about these boats and even the implications they actually have for um, Drogheda and its commercial heritage. Um, so just give a very uh, quick rundown on context of these boats. Uh, the green dots on the map on the right hand side are uh, discovery locations of them. We have approximately 500 uh, of them have been found in Ireland um, from dating from discoveries dating from the 18th century right the way through to obviously the more recent ones in the, in the River Boyne there. Um, the distribution, um, they tend to be very much in the uh, northern half of the country. You're looking at the Shannon Basin, Carabmoy, um, yeah, Erin, uh, Ney, Loch Ney basins. And um, that's because the topography of Ireland is quite unique in comparison to our uh, Euro European neighbours, uh, in the sense that we have a series of large and not so large lakes that um, are um, accessed by interconnecting waterways. And indeed, e even short hops over from one watershed into the other, or one water catchment into the other, uh, to be able to access these um, locations. So, um, this map uh, is pretty much up to date. Well, it shows uh, 436 dugout boat discoveries. Uh, I mentioned that there are about 500. Uh, we know of um, some more recent sort of ones, uh, like uh, the underwater unit. I've uh, been following on from the discoveries by Captain Trevor Northage a few years ago in, um, in Loch Carib, uh, just along here. You see, we don't really have them reflected on the distribution map. We do know that there are a number of boats there. They've been recorded by the underwater unit. Uh, what number we don't know, just that information isn't accessible, uh, but hopefully it will be someday, possibly in the future. Um, you will see on the distribution map on the right that there's a lot of uh, blue, uh, a lot of rivers. The distribution software um, that we were using couldn't filter out the unnavigable rivers, the shallower ones, so that's why you've seen so many of them here. But at least the map on the left will give you some sort of level of um, indication of the uh, locations of navigable sort of waterways. How it compares to Europe, you'll see Ireland here is like um, a rash of measles, but also Denmark and along uh, the stretches of the Baltic coast uh, is also got a similar rash of measles. Um, in general, um, 
the differ in their distribution patterns uh, from Ireland. Denmark is very much sort of close to what it is within sheltered waters. Um, Ireland, we have 65% of our dugout boat discoveries are from lakes, and um, about 30% come from uh, rivers, 4% from, um, from estuaries, and 0.5% from coastal locations. That distribution pattern is completely turned on its head when we're looking at our nearest neighbour, uh, the UK, and also mainland Europe. They tend to be 70% uh, of them are found in rivers and about 25% of them in lakes. The only one that really bucks the trend to uh, any degree and becomes more comparable to Ireland will be uh, the Alpine region along here. Um, but again, they're almost entirely in uh, lakes and they have uh, no navigable or interconnecting waterways uh, that we have in Ireland. In Ireland, it, it really is just, uh, I suppose, the best way of comparison, I, I think, uh, analogy will be to call it, um, you know, a, a national Venice of the medieval or prehistoric sort of period, because this form of interconnectivity and communication into the heartland of Ireland was just so critical to the dynamic of, uh, of settlement and migration patterns and communication and trade right the way from the first settlers in Ireland and to, to even the modern sort of period as well. We'd see the proliferation of boat use on our fresh waterways. Um, so in terms of the river boats, um, I was just sort of focusing as we go along uh, a little bit in towards the, uh, the Boeing boats and giving the sort of background leading into it. Uh, we have um, uh, 126 uh, boats that we know of that were found in riverine contexts. Um, however, um, 39 boats, uh, we have little or no information on them. And this can be you know, a couple of reasons. It can be that the time that they were discovered was very early in our understandings of archaeological recordings and processes. So very basic information was kept or else no information just was noted. And um, because these boats tend to be large on really objects, they can often be left on river banks or lake shores and um, they just disintegrate into nothing then, you know, as a consequence of that. So um, it can be hard to get the information now, we, we know uh, in terms of groups of boats that we, we have no records of, or there are records, but they're not accessible. Uh, we know there are something like between two and five, maybe possibly more boats from the River Boyne at uh, Drogheda um, that have um, been discovered and have been recorded. And that information was with the underwater unit there in the National Monument Services, but just uh, inaccessible to, to us uh, as a consequence. And um, similarly, upriver from uh, Limerick and the River Shannon, there's a collection of, um, of dugout boats that have been found during the last several years. Hopefully someday we'll be able to get some information on those. Um, in terms of the groups of boats with no information, we have a collection of them on the River Blackwater, uh, just to the southwest side of Loch Ney. We have some information on some, like Blackwater Town, we know that was recorded, there were several boats found there, but that was all the only, inf only information we have. Uh, similarly, places like the collection of Three Rivers in North Kerry here, the Brick, Cashin and Feel. Um, we know there are seven boats there. There's one boat that survives and uh, it's a very interesting boat. So um, not having much information on the other boats, very little information. It's, it's, it's tantalising evasive. Similarly, uh, up on the River Foyle at um, St. Johnson, there's four boats there. And that's important because of how that waterway has been used in the past. I should say as well that um, when I'm talking about dugout boats here and about that uh, 500 have been found, if you think that these are the, un, no, these are just not just, these are just one type of boat that would have functioned in our fresh waterways. I uh, would have had plank, reed and skin boats as well. Of course, we know the Boyne coracles um, as an example, but uh, it shows just the huge proliferation of boats and the use of waterways. Um, you know, right the way through prehistory into the modern era. And um, it's just that the dugout boats are a single non-composite uh, piece of wood, if you like, that they survive, you know, to uh, enter into the archaeological record. Whereas if you can imagine the other um, boats are manufactured, so they disintegrate and they fall apart. And even if there are remains left on the lakeshore or the riverbank, they can be so vague, like, I mean, they can just look like any bit of wood because they've been denuded to such a small sort of extent that we don't really recognize them. So they can be very hard to find. Um, 
So uh, of those boats that we actually have records of from the rivers, um, 39% of them are sufficiently well recorded. And, and these five boats here now I mentioned are all around here, the south, south of Loch Ney. Um, so it's good information from those boats. Um, in terms of groups, we have 44 boats. So we've got almost 50 boats um, that we, we have good records from uh, River Rhine sort of context. And again, we've got good records in, um, in Northern Ireland. So it gives the context of the recent discoveries in, um, or rediscoveries even of um, the Boyne boats are very important. So they really do stand out that we have, you know, records there of seven boats now um, um, that we did recently. We've got, um, we, we know of 12, there's possibly more boats as well. So they actually have very, very important information. And as much information that we can actually give and that is actually shared in terms of this data from other discoveries as well, really helps and adds into our understandings of um, the context and the importance and the details and immediately of the uh, use of our waterways and, um, and the environment, you know, really does, you know, begin, you know, show, um, you know, a huge invaluable sort of information. So it's important that this information comes out and we will show this in terms of the Boyne discoveries. Um, so, uh, until recently, the Clon McNoise boats here, the 10 boats there, they believe they had 11 of them. Um, this came from a, a medieval bridge excavation there on the River Shannon in 1997 and 1998. Um, so there were 10 boats from there. And I, only in the last few weeks, I managed to get access to that material. And there's actually new, insightful and exciting discoveries in relation to the dynamic of the Abbey, the castle, and uh, the use of the, um, the river. There. So it's actually adding in another mosaic to the story of medieval Ireland at Clamont Noise. And as you'll see here, the Boyne isn't uh, too shy of that situation as well. Um, so as I mentioned, I said 436, forgive me, it's 437 uh, boats that we actually have good records on. Um, but again, this gives you just a breakdown of basic information of what inf you know, percentage of information that we do actually have on the totality of these, these boats. So it is varying in uh, degrees of information that actually have been recorded over time. You can see 42% of these boats with no data at all, and only 8% of dugout boats have actually been uh, dated. Obviously, the majority of them are found in uh, a non-archaeological context, as Anthony was showing you there. So um, you know it's important that they are dated. And we do know that there are uh, boats that actually have been recorded, but the records of them remain inaccessible. So we don't know what information there is there at this moment in time. Um, the typology of these boats, uh, many people have tried, many practitioners have tried um, domestically and abroad to uh, create a typology of, of boats. As archaeologists, we, we love to create typologies. We love to, uh, to do, to classify them. And the importance of being able to do this to artifacts is that we can actually give a better and more detailed understanding of the artifacts, the use of them and uh, the context in which they're employed. And it gives us more in-depth understanding of the culture of society that actually use them. So uh, we've looked at trying to be able to create a typology for dugout boats and um, the common different shapes and sizes. None of this is based on any chronological sequence. Quite often and with artifacts, there is a chronological sequence but it is the environment of the boat and the use to which it was going to be used is the determining factor of what and how the, the boats actually look. Um, the system that's still used to this day is McGrail, it's in the 1970s. You can see some of the uh, uh, classifications he gave and they are very much based on the shape of the boat um, and given the uh, terminology of modern boats. Um, so this has got a limited application because it can actually end up cul de sac in how we think and how we interpret these boats. We start thinking of them as modern sort of boats, like he has a barge shaped boat. It looks like a barge, but it was not a cargo boat. It was a local individual um, use boat. So it starts making us think in the wrong direction. So it's important that we do have these sort of typologies. But I've been working on one for several years and been you know, hitting the restart button a couple of times. Um, but in terms of um, these boats, they're made from a single non-composite design. So they're not manufactured per se. So it gives a huge fluidity of the shape and, and whole design. And this can change the nuances of actually how we understand and how we interpret them. 
but all equally makes it very difficult to, for us to be able to, to classify them. Um, but the direction which I'm working on in my uh, typology at the moment is that the shape and size of the boats are determined by the environment in which they were used and the uh, intended design uh, of these boats. And the Boeing boats are no strangers to this, as we'll actually see. So that's the emerging patterns there. So just going into the Boeing boats now and looking at the previously recorded ones. Um, now in 1827, you see the yellow dot here, there is a boat found uh, during dredging at Old Bridge uh, over the East End, over at Levering. Uh, we have in 1956, there's a boat uh, discovered in unrecorded circumstances. And in 1997, uh, Levering too here, uh, archaeological consultancy services uh, were monitoring Drogheda's main drainage and they uh, found fascinating dug that boat there, um, which Kieran kindly, uh, your treasurer kindly drew my attention to. I've actually forgotten about that, so more about that. In 2013, um, there was a boat that was found at an unrecorded location. It was found by the Boyne Fisherman's Rescue and Recovery Service uh, while they were uh, doing shopping trolley removal expedition. So these are general sort of locations apart from Levering 2, which we know the exact grid coordinates of. So I'm sort of, I suppose, guessing based on the limited information that I actually have where they were found. So um, this unrecorded location with the shopping trolley expedition, uh, sort of put in a sort of more or less in the central draw to sort of the shopping district. So it might have been that sort of location, but I, I, I'm sure I'm not too far off the mark in, in that. Um, then in 2016, there was a, an old bridge, a Yellow Island boat, which um, is very interesting one. That was dated in the Neolithic period. So this boat and Leverine 2 were uh, the only two of the Boeing boats that have been dated so far. In terms of the uh, boats that were discovered by Anthony, or rediscovered uh, by Anthony, as the case may be, um, you know, on the ones we examined this year, uh, this is the very first one that Anthony pointed out, Rathmullen one with the... Uh, with the uh, medieval person's supposed trousers in it. And uh, the second one um, was here in Mel that we looked at a couple of weeks after that, uh, or at the same day, I should say, and then a couple of weeks later, uh, Money More um, is the second one. We, If you notice that I'm naming the boats after the timelines in which they're discovered, we're following the National Museum uh, topographical file sequence in which they um, name the artifacts after the townland as being the uh, primary recording criteria, and then there's tiers or secondary and ter tertiary levels of uh, recording processes that uh, give location and so on. So we're following that sort of sequence. Um, Rathmullen 2 then is the uh, next one that uh, we looked at, uh, followed by Rathmullen 3. So all of these were more or less the same sort of area. So I suppose that was the area where Anthony and Finn were taking their um, COVID um, ambles and doing the father son bonding, much to our advantage and to the uh, archaeological sort of sector and draw it to heritage, uh, you know, appreciation. So, uh, as I said, we know that there's about two to five um, more boats that uh, the underwater unit um, have information on and have the records and indeed uh, have examined to some degree or other. Um, but unfortunately, we just don't have that information. I know that one of these boats is in the um, National Museum stores in Swords, and I have seen it there while I was examining um, you know, a couple of other boats, but um, until I have permission, I'm not allowed to say anything about any of that until or whenever that permission comes forward. Uh, so in relation to Rathmullen 1, the very first one that Anthony uh, brought our attention to, um, he described the circumstances of discovery and its location. So um, I can move on to just a description of it. It's a uh, length, it's a uh, complete boat, um, or almost complete, I should say. It's uh, just over 3.6 metres in length, 60 centimetres wide, uh, 33 centimetres in external height. It has a floor thickness of five centimetres and its sides are three centimetres thick. So um, as you can see, it's very much a parallel sided boat, very squared ends to it. This is the stern end here on the right hand side. Um, but it does have a level of a, a turning up, if you like, a longitudinal sort of section. They are very sort of squared and it's very sort of, uh, I suppose, a boxy sort of, um, you know, profile as well in cross section. So um, this boat now uh, would have been a very poor performer in terms of dealing with the buoyant current because it is quite a strong current. Um, some of you may be familiar with that. Um, 
So this boat wouldn't have gone very far, would have only been for local access or local work. Um, what really struck us was uh, the extent to which there was simply much more detail paid to how the interior was fashioned and functioned uh, over that of any uh, hydrodynamic sort of uh, properties um, or naval architectural sort of properties of the external hull. Uh, now, as I mentioned, it was a very poor performer. But what we actually have here is a floor, five centimeters thick along the bottom here. But then it came up to shelf element on the bow and on the stern, which gave it an overall floor thickness of 10 centimeters. So effectively it was a shelf with a lip on it here. So this, this lip was about 60 centimeters from either end, about eight centimeters wide and three meters high. Uh, so it, it really struck me that uh, there were separate areas that whatever was occurring on the shelved areas, and um, there were items that were being kept were prevented from being falling or uh, cluttering into the, you know, the main body of the boat or the lower area. So that really gave me the sense of that this um, floor area, midships area, was either going to be subject to being getting wet uh, through whatever the activity was, um, or else it was deliberately um, wetted or had water put into it as part of the functioning of it. Another feature that we found was a two centimeter hole, which is just a small dock there, and uh, midships on the stern. You see it's angled through um, the stern here as well. And in talking to colleagues as well, um, you know, about what the possible function of it was, I had various sort of theories about mooring and the rest of it, and I you know, immediately discounted all of them because this uh, showed no signs of any wear at all. And it would have been used to hold a rod or something um, that would have come over and risen into the interior of the boat. So um, in terms of speculating about this, there are no parallels that I could find within any European counterparts or with any sort of um, you know, colleagues. I, um, I put feelers out uh, to an organization that I'm a member of, which is called Early Watercraft, and it's a global organization. So we freely share information, um, you know, which is a great resource. Uh, but no one was able to uh, tell me of any sort of comparable boat that they actually found from their region of the world. So in terms of thinking about it, you know, I, I, I came to the conclusion that it must be used for fishing, that the interior of the, the boat, the midships area was there used to hold fish, and that's why the area was kept wet, or maybe, you know, a few centimetres of water to keep the fish alive. And that the lit element to the shelves was to stop whatever accoutrements and uh, were being used from falling in and getting in the way or getting mixed up with the fish. Um, this hole uh, coming up and holding support in what I believe is a rod, um, I've conjectured, conjecturalized that this is um, to hold a lantern or a flame you know, for night fishing. Um, so what I'm really looking at is that this boat would, wouldn't have traveled very far at all. It was locally used and um, you know, what was used for fishing and possibly night fishing as well. When I talked to some of my colleagues in the uh, fishing fraternity, informed me that in Ireland, the fish species that are fished, um, excuse me, <clears throat> uh, don't ascend the water column to be attracted by light for fishing. Rather, what actually happens is that the lantern light at night time is used to mollify or stupefy the fish so they're much more easily sort of caught. So apparently, um, you know, it's an illegal activity now to do night fishing. So uh, maybe that's sort of fallen out of fashion or uh, out of knowledge. So um, with this new boat, um, you know, it, it really predicated me to looking at the previous discoveries as well, to see if there's any sort of comparable material and also on a national basis as well, if there's any other sort of boat that's comparable to this. But in the meantime, anyway, went on looking at the next boat. And this is uh, from um, Money Moore. On the north bank of the river. So uh, Anthony showed you a photograph here and you can see the top left. Uh, this is the length of the boat. It's 6.27 meters long. Its average width is 76 centimeters. Internal height is 10 centimeters. It's incomplete and uh, side thickness was two centimeters. And again there is a lift shelf 60 centimeters from the bow of the boat. I'll put this end here just amongst the rocks here. There's a vague outline there. I don't know if you can see that. This bottom right photograph was taken by Anthony um, in the serendipitous circumstances of um, 
it being natural clear water and low spring tide. Um, every time I went in subsequent to that, looking at these boats, it was at spring tide conditions, but you can see that it had been rained beforehand. It just completely muddied the water. So it's working on feel and with the tape there, you can see the two poles here marking the width of the boat. But you can see just the, the force of the water there now, it, it just really inhibited any sort of massively sort of detailed examination. And that is where there is a narrow out of the neck of, um, of, the, of the river there as well. So all the water has been forced through into a smaller sort of um, width of the river and um, you know, just catching a footing on the riverbed was, was quite treacherous and you know, continuously in danger of getting washed away. So obviously the life jacket was a very important sort of a tool there. Um, uh, yeah, this boat is also, uh, while it's longer than the previous boat I showed you there, it's, it still shares the same sort of qualities. It's got the same parallel sides. It's got the same squared end. So it would be a very poor uh, functioning boat within a river uh, with the current of the strength of the Boyne. And again, it was just used for local use. And once more, these boats were designed for the work in the interior. They're designed specifically for the office of the workplace if you like. So everything was just pointing to logically to it being you know, that of a fishing sort of boat. But um, I wasn't as yet willing to put my head above the parapet and sort of, you know, conclusively say that it is a fishing boat at this particular moment in time. I was just, um, you know, I'd say I'm favouring this theory. So the next boat um, was a Rathmullen um, 3 and it is on the south bank of the river. Uh, it was upside down. Um, so this is, you know, a limited amount that, that we were able to draw because of that. When we were looking at these boats, uh, we were very careful as well not to disturb them as well, because um, doing that uh, would constitute an illegal excavation and we didn't want to disturb them. And even sort of dislodge them from the suction activity of the river moss, holding them and anchoring them in place was very important as well. So we were very careful that we actually, you know, record them and uh, made brief reports and emailed them off to the underwater unit of the National Monument Services and into the National Museum of Ireland. So you can see at spring tide, this is all that was uh, exposed of it here, and uh, it's, it's largely incomplete. Its surviving length is 4.1 metres and a maximum incomplete width of 47 centimetres. Its external height, um, on just on the riverside over here, uh, it was 37 centimetres. I'm quite happy that that was the original height of the boat as well. Now, the floor thickness of six centimetres and uh, side thickness of three centimetres. So I was able to um, feel in under the boat just at this point here, or you can see it just here. It's a start of the turn up of the end, quite uh, most probably uh, the stern end. And you could feel that there was a lip shelf and that was actually just over one metre from the the stern of the boat here. So again, another you know, probable sort of fishing boat. Uh, moving on to um, two boats that were um, found the last few years. Uh, it was Oldbridge and Lavarine one. So Oldbridge is here and Lavarine is here. Now, um, I was saying there earlier that we went back to re-examine um, the boats that had previously been found as well as you know the national records as well to see if there's any other comparable boats um, to these ones, and Oldbridge and Lavarine, lo and behold, were the same, or as good as, um, you know, it's certainly from the same family of dugout boat. Again, we're looking at similar patterns here. This is the Oldbridge boat here. It's 5.7 metres long, 86 centimetres wide, and uh, grand height of uh, 51 centimetres. Uh, it had um, three um, alls recorded in it, two of them as thickness gauges. Here's one of them drawn, and then there's another. Um, I'm sorry, I'm getting mixed up now. Um, no, no, that's, you know, I'm talking about the right boat there, yeah. So uh, there's one that was recorded in the stern as well, but, uh, but we just don't see it here. Um, so again, we have that lipped element here, the thicker uh, end. And uh, then the very one is 4.6 metres long. It's incomplete, as you can see. Um, width of 55 centimetres height of 20 centimetres, again showing the same hull characteristics as the boats that we examined. And there were two holes uh, found in it, one of which was a thickness gauge, which is just marked just here, and another one which could have been uh, a stern uh, lantern holder again, and it was eroded, so it is actually increased in size to six by three centimetres. But um, 
when we were looking at, and we were talking to uh, our colleagues abroad um, and they weren't able to return any information of any sort of comparable material. Anthony one day was looking at his, um, his social media feed and um, up popped on Facebook um, was this fellow here. Certainly not a native Drada or, uh, or loud person or me for that matter. Um, but this is um, was Malaysia or Thailand. Um, I'm not too sure which country. Uh, so I'd like to find out more about this boat. But it's a plank built boat, as you can see. But look what it has. It has a fellow uh, with an operating area here that he's keeping his materials dry. He has a shelf and there's fish that he's actually long line fishing and putting them in live into it. So presumably, presumably that he's a commercial fisherman and he's uh, topping up water in here as well. So this is a video footage and here's the, the link to it. Um, interestingly enough, this boat is a plank built boat. But you can see that it shares the same sort of similarities of hull um, profile to our dugout boats. And in, it shares the same profile to, to normal dugout boats, all dugout boats in it have been very slender hull. Um, it's our cross section sort of profile emulates that of dugout boats. And um, it just happened to be a plank built variety. So, for all intents and purposes, we were looking around on the other side of the world you know, um, a distant uh, descendant of our boats, you know, our fishing boats from the Boyne. So when I saw this mo this uh, video here that Anthony sent me, you know, that was it. That, that was the eureka moment. We have the information that says, yes, these boats in the Boyne are fishing boats. Uh, we be wonderful if we got further information in terms of night fishing as well. Um, so I suppose that can be argued, you know, between myself and other colleagues as well about whether that occurred or not. Um, Interesting enough, we have the cot tradition, and everyone knows the ones in the Shore and the Three Sister Rivers. Um, so basically, uh, they're uh, descendants, they're plank built boats, but they're descendants of the, of the dugout boats, they share the same profile and so on. This is a colleague of mine, uh, uh, Ray Lomig, an artist that actually uh, gave representation of the Boyne. So we've got the Mel uh, Mullins or Townlands here. And if you can imagine, you know, night fishing or even day fishing occurring here, that this is a commercial sort of enterprise um, that it fed the possible medieval export market. If you think that Drogheda was at one point was um, Ireland's principal medieval port and it's now the river is known for its sea trout and it has eel and salmon runs as well. So you can imagine sort of commercial enterprise so you're catching the fish fresh uh, for the local uh, consumption of the local market, but also uh, conceivably before being shipped abroad to um, Britain and even onto the continent, you know, as well. So um, it's, it's certainly a nice thought, like maybe we have um, this sort of enterprise occurring here. Um, and if you think of the boats were actually occurring all the way stretches from Old Bridge right the way down to Lake of Orion. So that really sort of shows just the level of enterprise that was actually occurring. I should say this one here, yeah, that's it there, yeah. So uh, you can imagine the entire sort of stretch of the river being used for commercial sort of fishing. Uh, so going on to Mel um, here, um, this boat was incomplete and uh, gets a sense of the scale of uh, the Coast Guard coming along and uh, they were doing exercise that day, so they kindly uh, assisted on their modelling ranging rods there at either end of the boat. It, you can see it's very much incomplete. It's upside down. Uh, it's 4.2 metres long. It's maximum width at this point here, which will normally be its full width as uh, 1.04 uh, metres. And I, and I believe that was the actual sort of stern of it there. It's very sort of blocky square stern. It would have, it's got a tapered hull. Um, so it's emulating the, um, the shape of the original tree trunk. So that's telling us that it's looking to maximize the internal space of the boat because um, the most efficient form of uh, hull um, will be a leaf like hull. Next one will be a parallel sided one. So they have tend to have the lesser sort of friction as the boat travels through water especially in uh, strong currents like the Boyne. And these taper boats would have had um, a, a pointed bow or a rounded point to try and uh, separate the water as smoothly as possible to reduce the whole uh, friction. So the very fact that it's tapered is increasing its, uh, the levels of friction and making it harder to propel it. So showing that the overriding criteria for this boat was internal capacity, therefore cargo carrying. And with the pointed bow was in the consideration of the strong water environment that it was trying to, you know, split the um, 
the, 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 the current and be able to make some sort of headway as well. So it's um, very thick sides for dugout boats at four centimetres. Typically, there are three centimetres coming up to two centimetres at the top edge. So uh, quite, quite a robust boat. The next boat I'm looking at is Lagavorian uh, 2. And I'd like to thank Kieran Campbell because talking to him a few months ago, he mentioned that Archaeological Consultancy Services did uh, work there in the 1990s and they came across the dugout boat. So on the foot of that, I said, OK, I'll, I'll contact Donald Murphy, um, the owner of the company there. And um, he said, sure, Niall. And he sent me a copy of the report that was done on it. And lo and behold, it was one that I did. I'd completely forgotten about it. You know, it was just examining so many boats over the years. Uh, sometimes you forget about those ones that you actually have, have done. So it was great. I'm grateful to Kieran as well, bringing that to my attention as well. In particular, because this is another cargo boat as well. Again, it's incomplete. It's got the, in plan, you can see the tapered profile of it here. Very interesting boat. It survives to about six, just over six metres. Uh, it probably would have been anything from nine to ten, ten and a half metres in uh, original length. It's a maximum width of uh, 91 centimetres at the stern. Um, the external height is 48 centimetres, and I believe that's pretty much close to the original height. Uh, not all the sides um, survived to you know, the full extent elsewhere on the boat. And a floor thickness of five centimetres to eight centimetres, which is quite unusual, and I will come back to that with a side thickness of four centimetres of the base, tapering to, you know, two centimetres of the top. You can see the profile of it there. It had um, what's called a fitted transom aboard, uh, enclosing what would have been the open end of the boat. And again, this, this is showing that we're looking at uh, the builders seeking to maximise the, um, you know, the uh, full use of cargo carrying capacity. So either they hollowed out and removed the stern of it out, to lighten the boat and increase the, uh, the cargo carrying capacity rather than having a solid blocky sort of stern there. Or else it could have been tree that actually had hardwood rot and um, they utilized the fact that it was already partially hollowed out. Um, so um, there's thickness gauges, six pairs of it running along um, the length of it here. We have uh, a split that was repaired, the split, um, Curves here. I, I should say about the thickness gauges as well. It's um, a technique of construction that the boat or the tree trunk is always hollowed out first of all into an external hollow shape, then it's turned over and hollowed out. So if you can imagine as you're hollowing out the tree trunk, the amount of wood chippings that comes up and piles up around the outside of the boat, so you no longer know how thick the floor of the boat is. So drilling holes into the bottom of the boat before you turn it over means you, once you encounter the holes, you know how thick the floor of the boat is, and then you can plug it afterwards. Um, so we have this repair, and there's a uh, dovetail uh, buttons uh, set into the floor of the boat to uh, secure it and actually pull the two sides together. And there's a very large knot hole here, 15 um, by 7.5 centimetres at this point here. And there is actually sapwood occurring along this part of the boat here, which is a weak um, part of, of the tree that wouldn't be used if they didn't have a choice. So what we're actually learning from this was that it was a very poor quality tree and that there were ins, uh, insufficient boat, or trees of uh, the correct size in the area where the boat was being made or being commissioned to be made as a cargo sort of boat. So they were looking at a very poor sort of quality of tree trunk. A lot of tool marks uh, and it's quite an inordinate amount of them as well. A lot of axe marks along the sides of the of the boat and in the floor and around the repair work as well. And um, there's shot, sorry, signature blade lengths of six and a half centimeters. Then we had a T-shaped axe with nine centimeter blade lengths on the interior on the sides, and that's sort of shaving off, reducing the um, the thickness of the sides. And the axe marks of five centimeters on the floor of the boat as finishing tools. But a, a lot of these uh, axe marks and axe marks were quite deep as well. So. I actually know that this boat was one of two things. It was either made by very uh, unskilled craftspeople or boat builders, or else it was made by skilled boat builders, but it was a rush job. And it's certainly based on my experience of examining these, boat, these boats and, um, uh, and making them as well. I certainly favour the latter theory there. Um, so uh, the, the floor being five to eight centimetres thick, you know, that waviness, uh, it was a huge amount of dead weight that's actually in the floor of the boat. So normally they're trying to take as much excess weight out of the boat by um, taking 
uh, as much wood as possible out so that they can actually convert that space into actually cargo carrying capacity. But the very fact that it was so uh, unevenly made, the ax marks in there and so on, the, that really shows that this was you know, an actual sort of rush job. So it was a rushed commission. And uh, this was found, as I said, um, on the, as part of the main drainage. And it was found by side a wooden jetty that was dated to 1066. So there's our second uh, you know, dated boat. Uh, incidentally, Donald said to me that uh, there's a lot of uh, leather shoes that were found in the river muds. Um, so a lot of people sort of uh, lost their shoes or going home from working on the docks uh, that day and explained to their wife that they're going to have to go off the shops to buy another pair of shoes the next day for them. And certainly um, when I was traipsing along in the river muds there, I can uh, feel that pain because I nearly lost my, um, my wetsuit bees a couple of times there as well. So um, going to the second last boat here, Rath Mullen to um, this is uh, incomplete, it's tantalizing incomplete, and it's insufficient amount of information to be able to conclusively say anything in, ter uh, in interpretation of uh, what it was actually designed for. And here you can see some of the muds, the river muds that, that I was slipping and getting stuck in as well. So um, as I said, I can uh, really feel for our, um, our, our medieval dock workers. Um, the surviving length of this is just over 3.3 meters long. 21 centimeters wide and 38 centimeters in external height. We know that this is the correct original external height uh, because of this feature here, which I'll come back to in a minute. Um, so it has a floor thickness of four centimeters to 12 centimeters, very finely made, but it increased to 12 centimeters at the upturn, at the rise of the end, which is uh, not an unusual sort of feature in these sort of boats that get thicker at the ends, because it is the ends that actually hold the entire tree trunk together and stops it from splitting. Quite often, most of these boats, it's just the floor uh, that we get and the indications of the upturns of the sides and the ends, because the heart or the pit at the center of the tree trunk that is at either end of the boat has radially split out. And once that actually happens, the sides go, the, the ends go, we've only got the floor as the solid piece that's left. Um, there's a hole, two centimeter, so a three centimeter diameter hole set here in the boat as well. You can see it here, very finely made. I believe this is a thickness gauge, but the very fact that uh, it was so close to one side makes me feel that this was a narrow boat originally. And um, I believe that there's a possibility that it could have been a paired boat. But again, this is just conjecture and it's based on uh, similarities and parallels to a boat that I examined in 2011 in the river of Voga at Arklo. Uh, which was a paired boat, it was uh, would originally have been a ferry boat. The fact that uh, it has this feature here, which is in the photograph in the bottom right uh, corner, is a thwart rest. Um, that held a plank in place and it had a twin on the other side of the boat, um, so that would have been a seat. It means that there's a possibility that it could have been rolled, but I don't think so because we would have had other features on the um, sides. Although, having said that, maybe it could be on the missing part of the boat. If it was a rowboat, I'd be much more happy of saying that it was a ferry boat. But the narrowness of it makes me feel that it would have had a twin hull pairing up beside it as well, because it would have been just too narrow uh, you know, to function otherwise. I, I, I could be mistaken on this because such a small amount of the boat um, survives. So we can't really say conclusively one way or the other what uh, it was actually used for. I'd love to be able to, but sometimes we just have to walk away until other information comes to light or you know, you know, just, you know, chalk that one down to, you know, unknown. And the final um, uh, two boats there are, I should say, yeah, just looking at uh, two other boats that, um, just looking at two other boats that are, were found, uh, one at an unrecorded location I mentioned there, and the other one is Old Bridge, Yellow Island. The Old Bridge, Yellow Island one, that was dated to 3300 BC to 2900 BC. And I got this information on this from a website and newspaper article. Uh, the actual records of it are inaccessible to me. Very interesting boat, uh, aside from being uh, Neolithic. Uh, it's very beamy, very wide. And um, when I was trying to interpret this boat, I was looking at maybe there's a general sort of purpose sort of boat, but it was just fitting uncomfortable with me because the thickness of the floor combined with the, the width, um, you know, just meant it was in the wrong environment really for uh, a fast flowing river like the River Boyne, I expect it to be in a river that had a stack or sort of current. 
So in, in terms of in terms of interpretation of it being general purpose, it just didn't sit very well, um, you know, with me. But um, I was talking to Anthony yesterday, and um, you know, I, I was actually sitting down to have a little break. I was having my porridge, uh, just working from home during these COVID days as well. And uh, I was looking at uh, sort of news feeds on my phone, and there was a journal.ie paper, and it was about uh, the uh, the passage grave uh, monuments in the boy in the Boone Boyne and. Lo and behold, when he opened it up, there was Anthony being interviewed by the uh, by the newspaper and sent him a message, message just saying, geez, I just can't get away from you, can I, you know? So uh, we started talking about, um, about the paper and the, the article and uh, some of the points that he was raising, like examples such as uh, Nauth being, um, the rock art of Nauth possi possibly being a lunar sort of calendar. And he was saying, you know, wouldn't it be great if we could tie that in with, uh, you know, with, with, with the river or the boats? And I was going, well, actually, yeah, we can. It was a bit of a, it was either a Homer Simpson moment or a Eureka moment. I don't know um, which you favour. But anyway, um, I talk to my wife sometimes, I think she says Homer Simpson. But, um, it, you know, I said to him, well, well, look, you know, that we're looking at spring tides. We're examining these boats at spring tides. The slackest current and the easiest current to combat is going to be the rising tide at spring tide occasion when the water, the river levels at its lowest. And the headwater is rising, so it's easier to float it up. So this boat could have been used then. Why would it have been used then? Because it must have been carrying something large, something heavy. So could it conceivably have been the orthostats, the large stones from Clara Head that were used to make the passage graves in Brun de Boyne? And I, I think that's a very reasonable sort of assumption. So like we were, we're very excited about this. And um certainly we're, we're you've heard it here first, and we're um certainly looking further into it. And um you know, see, see where uh, where this theory, theory leads us. Um, so you've heard it here first anyway. And finally, the last um, boat was uh, at an unrecorded location. This is the shopping trolley incident. And this is uh, was taken from a website newspaper article as well. And uh, you can see that it is embedded in the river muds. It's parallel side, it's very finely made. But one unusual feature is um, is this uh, one here that is carved from a solid on the top edge, the gunnel of the boat. And there's been speculation that this could be uh, a mount for an oar. Or I would consider that to be extremely unlikely because the mounts for oars would have had a hole drilled into um, this depression here and a uh, pin pulled through. There's no hole. This is actually a finished hole. This is a finished sort of product and is actually finished and used in the river. So I think it must have been used for something else, but it could be proven wrong. So um, finally, just the last slide in terms of recapping, we have um, five boats that were used for fishing, and um, they show, like I mean, that there must have been a commercial fishing enterprise going on, uh, definitely for the domestic uh, market, and most likely also for the export market during the medieval period. Uh, we have two cargo boats carrying goods. Um, from Drogheda and probably the ships arriving upriver, as well as taking cargo downriver uh, for the market in Drogheda and uh, the export market as well. Um, the general purpose boat now, now speculating it is that it was uh, carrying stones, the orthostats, up to uh, Bruna Boyne. And then we have that one that remains unknown that may or may not be a ferry boat. So that's myself. And thank you very much for your time.